to later thank the organizer, especially Gao, uh, who gave me this opportunity to talk to you about some of our passions and why we are doing what we do. Um, I think uh, it's good to have my talk here because uh, actually a lot of the reasons why we are working so hard on this uh, little plan that I'll talk to you today about uh, already been described by the previous speakers, such as uh, Paul Fokoski and also Harry just talked about it. Right? I mean, that's the double whammy that we are facing in a short time in human history, right? which is about, let's say, 2050, when we, all, by all projection, is we going to reach like 9.5 billion, just more than 2 billion than we have now. Uh, and also, of course, the climate change. Um, that's going to be uh, in much worse scenario at that time, right? I mean, Paul gave you the conservative estimates of how high the ocean's going to rise and also temperature going up, and we passed the 400 ppm mark. So there are a lot of uh, issues that are not going to be solved overnight when we decide, okay, 2050 is here, we want to solve this, and we have no solution that will be very bad, okay, uh, especially for my kids. Um, so I think this is why we do what we do, um, and that is to try to balance the equation. The equation is growth versus sustainability, right? So humans are going I mean, this is why we are so successful. We are driven to accumulate stuff, right? We're driven to um, produce technology that allow us to mine the resources ever faster. And this is not a linear, right? As you all know, the last 200 years have seen tremendous increase in our capability of changing this planet, okay? That has never happened before. So we actually, just like Superman, we have great responsibility as well, right? And that's the stewardship that I want to talk about today. Um, and it's not going to be solved by one technology. It's going to be solved by multiple things. And of course, today, we are here for the bioeconomy. So we're going to talk about biology, and I'm a plant biologist, so I'm going to talk about the plant biologist's uh, perspective of what we can do to make an impact, okay? So I don't profess to give you a silver bullet to solve these problems. Um, you know, it's, that's why uh, actually I get to know Gao, because we need to work together as a team where we have different uh, specialties and different uh, expertise that we can put together to make a solution real, okay? Because I can make something in the lab, I'm a plant biologist, but if it doesn't get out there in time, okay, it doesn't matter, right? Um, so I think that's is the thing that I list here, um, over here on the um, left here to you, uh, are some of the things that we are focusing on in agriculture now to make it modern, right? Precision agriculture. What does that mean? Well, that means that we can monitor our fields so we don't do excessive fertilizing, right? Or pesticides, so we don't over degrade our environment for the sake of getting productivity, right? So these are the kind of challenges and responses that we as plant biologists are trying to help. And you heard about editing, genome editing technologies that are like, you know, everyone's doing it now. So, okay. Uh, so these are things that are tools that are rapidly coming online. Uh, and what we hope is that this will increase our productivity and minimize this burden on sustainability on the other side, right? Um, so um, the Aim is all fine and good, but is it enough, right? So we still are facing the problem, as I told you, of increasing population. To feed that extra 2 billion to 3 billion people in the next 25 years is a big challenge, okay? Um, so what we think is that um, still we're going to need uh, better plants, okay? <laughs> uh, because we, we've been using the same plants as crops that we are eating right now have been I mean, used in agriculture for the past 10,000 years. Okay, they have improved, of course, through breeding, but they're basically the same. So what we think is that we should complement that with new crops that will allow us to have maybe more desirable qualities, right? Um, so some of these are, for example, easily scalable. And I'll talk about that today as one thing that actually, unfortunately, Greenonix isn't here because of uh, uh, some personal issues. But this is a company that I think has a very creative vision, right, of how we can attack the problem of urbanization 
where, you know, uh, in tandem with the increase in population, there's also migration of people from rural area to the urban area. So that, the result of that is that more and more food had to be shipped to support uh, these people that are living in cities, whereas you have you know, to ship them from very far away in big farms, right? Um, so scalable production of food uh, is, will be a very, very positive, in, have positive impact in this equation of uh, sustainable use of our resources and better and healthier foods for people, okay? Uh, environmentally friendly, rapid generation time, wide range of uh, adaptable uh, climate for this plan, high nutrition values, and then of course easy to harvest and process, okay, right? If I have a genie come out of the bottle, this is what I will ask him for, right? Or her, okay? Probably her is better, um, more sensible usually. <laughs> um, okay, so you know the answer because that's the title of my talk, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here, right? So duckweed actually is a, a well-known plant, right? This is the answer that is right in your backyard because duckweed is all over the world. So even little kids, when I show them, they say, oh yeah, I know that plant because they all seen it in their ponds and lakes, right, in the school, behind the schools. We have it right here in the passion puddle in the, in the back. Um, and it's the fastest growing plant in the world. The, part of the reason is because even though it's a flowering plant, it doesn't normally flower. So if you remember Steve was saying before how they selected for maize or, or uh, miscanthus that actually don't flower so quickly, right? That gives you that increase in that you know, second and third gear, right? So <laughs> the rest of the time in those two gears so that it grows a lot faster. Well, duckweed is a natural you know, second and third gear plant, okay, so that it just stuck there, okay? Uh, you got to really cook it to get it to flower, but it can. Um, but the, um, the, the magic is that uh, duckweed actually are known to have extremely high productivity, up to 80 to 100 metric ton per hectare per year, okay? That's about five times more than corn, for example, okay? Give you a rough estimate, right? And the cool thing about duckweed is that uh, it's small, okay? So just show you the smallest duckweed is about a millimeter in size. And this is where the scalability comes in, right? Small is beautiful because with this, you can grow a million liters or you can grow maybe 100 mil, right? <laughs> um, and so, um, and because there are large uh, amount of genetic variation, you can find very high protein strains or very high starch strain. And the last but not least, it has very low lignin level. You heard about lignin from Steve also. Uh, this is the thing that makes cell wall so tough in grasses. That's why you need a rumen to eat grass, okay? But with duckweed, you can eat it fresh because it only have 2% lignin, okay? Naturally. That's why people use it to feed the chicken and pigs just right off the pond, right? So it's very, very simple to harvest because it floats. And you can find it all over the world from Siberia to the Amazon. So it's really adaptable. And that's why we got interested in because we want to understand how a little plant like that can adapt to so much different diverse climate, right? Um, so I won't bore you with all the science on that. But uh, the, the key thing is that it can grow on wastewater. In fact, it naturally grows on wastewater. And there are companies that actually that we are working with in Argentina that are now implementing uh, or adapting duckweed into their wastewater treatment plan so that they can actually better and cheaper uh, clean the wastewater for their municipality, right? So those are all cool stuff that, um, you know, I don't have too much time to get into detail, but just to tell you the salient point. And this is the scalable part that really excites me, okay? Because this is a, a plant family that allow you to grow right on the desktop. Okay, this is what Green Onyx is supposed to uh, get into Costco next year, right? Um, where you can buy this uh, machine that will generate a kilo of fresh vegetable right off your desktop, right? And it runs on LED, so it's highly energy efficient, okay? Just on the battery, right? So I, I was telling Rachel that you can do you hook it up to your exercise machine and you generate your own food from your own energy, right? <laughs> so 
I mean, that, that's the idea, right? That you can actually take this to the desert or take it to Antarctica and you will have fresh salad, right? Um, so you can go to vertical farming. This is actually a vertical farm in Newark, New Jersey, very local, right? And this, I think it will be perfect for duckweed because uh, you're talking about a very thin layer of water, uh, aqueous environment that you can easily scale, okay, uh, into one of the largest indoor farm, right? Uh, where you have these, uh, you know, LED lights with precise uh, growth length, but wavelength to optimize uh, and have real precision farming, right? Uh, and of course, right now we're working with Mama Grande to do 150 hectares of wastewater treatment plant where you can scale to 18 tons uh, per day, fresh way, okay, of production, right? Uh, just from the wastewater with no input. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that this plan can do. Uh, just to give you one thing that we are very excited about is to talk about food. Okay, because uh, of course you can talk about biomass for fuel, but as you just hear, um, there's maybe another uh, you know, 10, 10, 15 years before uh, the, fuel, the oil prices will make it competitive, right? But protein, this is something that actually oil cannot give you, okay? You cannot eat fossil fuel, right? Well, not directly, okay? But <laughs> you use it to make fertilizer to grow plants. So um, if you look at the world's uh, kind of protein, kind of uh, intake market, uh, what I learned is that actually fish will become one of the dominant uh, source of protein for the world, okay? Uh, and that is because of aquaculture. Um, you, if you go to China, you see that the whole countryside are being converted into agriculture farm. It's one of the fastest growing industries in China. Uh, and that's because the ocean is fished out. I mean, I don't know if you know that, but uh, I just learned that tuna has dropped by like 85% in the, just in the past 50 years in the oceans, okay, uh, in terms of population. And we just ate them up, <laughs> okay. So what happened is people had to buy most of the fish from fish farms, and that's where you see this uh, deep blue line here compared to wild caught fish. And poultry is the other one that is going to go sky high, okay? Um, you know, beef is pretty much uh, going to stay uh, fairly flat just because it's very expensive to make beef, okay? Um, and with these, uh, you know, with aquaculture, you have a very high environmental cost, actually, because Intensive aquaculture is very dirty, okay, because the fish just so thick there in the water. Um, you eutrophy the, the water very quickly. A and the uh, feed represent about 50% of the aquaculture cost because that's where they get the protein, right? Um, so one of the ideas is to couple agriculture um, to um, actually, uh, you know, uh, using duckweed to Aquaculture. So in agriculture, like poultry farms or pig farms, you generate a huge amount of waste. And as I show you, po poultry and pork are the two meat products that are going very, very rapidly also. So their waste actually are becoming a huge problem environmentally. So the idea is really to uh, couple the uh, swine farms and chicken farms uh, with these waste lagoons um, that every farm has over there, uh, and grow duckweed on this and use that to actually now as to generate the fish food, right? And why we think we can do that is because the protein component of duckweed, which can reach up to 30 to 40 percent dry weight of the duckweed, uh, can in fact uh, be very good in terms of most of the uh, essential amino acids. Um, and the only one that is slightly lacking is methionine, which is about 50 to 70 percent of what you need, okay, for the um, daily requirement, for example, for fish. So um, the idea is that eventually we can really, um, eventually meaning in the near future, in the next few years, we can actually have this kind of uh, uh, system where we couple this a small aquatic plant to clean the wastewater from various sources, in this case, such as from fish farms, and generate the duckweed using uh, sunlight as a driver, and that will clean the water, uh, while at the same time you generate biomass that's either high in protein, 
and if we have high methionine strains of uh, duckweed, we can then uh, really have a very good diet to now supplement the fish food, okay, to minimize our dependence on soybean and other uh, sources that is currently where the fish is getting their food, okay? Um, so this is the vision is that this is a new era of domestication of a new, totally new kind of crop. That's aquatic agronomy, essentially. Because here you're talking about perennial plant that actually you harvest every week, okay? Not every season. But you harvest every week, and that uh, essentially will be self-regenerating. Uh, is on water, so it floats. So you can easily filter it and all that. So it's very different mechanics, okay? Um, but I think it's a challenge, but also very um, great for creative solutions, okay? Uh, and, but I think the clear, uh, you know, uh, importance is that we need to couple the science, okay, which is what we do, together with the engineering part, so that we are much smarter in selecting the proper strains and the proper traits, right, uh, for breeding, so that we can quickly, uh, I, you know, reach the kind of uh, strains that will be economically competitive, right? So I'm almost done. So um, this is kind of like what we do in the lab. Uh, we maintain uh, the world's largest collection, about a thousand strains of duckweed, uh, and we freely, you know, give that out to people at cost to build this community, we need a lot more people working on it. So uh, we, we're doing the grunt work, but I have a small lab actually, okay? So uh, we, ch we try to share and really teach people as much as we can so we don't have to do everything, okay? So um, that's, that's really my wish, okay? But what we are trying to do is to get this, uh, you know, for Harry, is a uh, jump started, okay? <laughs> we try to jump start this platform so that everyone start to do their thing with it. That, that will be the, the best uh, result that I can think of. So right now we have interest in high protein and high methionine strains. That would, that's what we've been using different ways to screen for and of course high starch strains. Um, and we think that with aquaculture, um, you know, uh, you, you really need uh, you know, genetic uh, and genomic approach to augment the traditional breeding. Um, so this is why we also spend a lot of time generating now, uh, and it's almost published, uh, really high resolution reference genome for, for duckweed. Uh, and hopefully this will really provide the foundation to uh, create this duckweed-based uh, bioeconomy, okay? So with that, I will just acknowledge people that are really essential to do the work. Um, mainly a lot of people in my lab uh, I, I won't name all of them, uh, but, um, and, uh, but I, I do collaborate with people outside, uh, like uh, contracting uh, genome institutes to help us sequence the genomes, uh, and all the informatic people and uh, uh, some of the engineering students that help us uh, to do the basic work. So I'll stop here. Thank you.